Okay, so uh, I'll just get started. Let other people in as they as they turn up. So great, welcome to another subservice rendezvous. And today we've got uh, Michael and Anton, which if you're on Swung, will have, uh, you'll probably know because they're pretty active on the Slack channel. And uh, they're going to talk to us about building geo web apps fast. And uh, it's a nice contrast to last week's event, which was all about how to try and bundle things in a portable way front end. Now it's how do you build a sort of fully fledged app that can be served, uh, sit, sit, can sit on the server, access data, and be served up to multiple people. Uh, so they're going to take us through two different uh, frameworks, uh, Streamlit and uh, Panel, which is going to be great. Uh, I think they've got lots of code to show us and examples. So we can just take our time. Uh, as usual, this isn't meant to be a sort of one-way presentation. This is sort of meant to be a, a place where we can just discuss, ask questions, and feel free to sort of jump up and ask a question at any time. If it's a timely question, you know, just unmute and interrupt. And uh, and I think the guys will be happy to ask uh, answer that. Otherwise, feel free also to drop it in the chat, either in Zoom or in uh, the Swung Slack, and we'll pick up on your questions sort of uh, in, in the breaks that we have there. So, so either way, but it's uh, definitely not meant to be one way and please ask all the questions that you want. So there's a bunch of people in already who are recognized from the Slack channel, but there's probably some others who don't know much about Swung. So I just wanted to make, before we start, make one sort of announcement that if you are new to Software Underground, please do go and check out the Software Underground site. That tells you uh, about how to access and join the, the Slack team where there's absolutely loads of stuff going on every day, all relevant to subsurface in, in geoscience. And that if you haven't yet, or if you don't know yet about Transform, which is next month, the upcoming, uh, online conference that Software Underground is doing. Uh, have a look there and see, you might want to sign up for that. It's going to be full of amazing sort of digital subsurface content, just like Anton and Michael's showing us today. So if you don't know about it yet, go and have a look at Transform 21. It's coming up in a couple of weeks. Okay. So I will turn it over to Michael first, who's going to kick off the the presentation. If you just want to share your screen. Mike. Great. Yep. Pulling it up now. So it should be should be live there for everyone to see. Yeah. Not yet. Not yet. Screen okay. two. Share. Okay. There we go. It is All right. Yet. Good. 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 All right. So yeah, I'm I'm Michael. Uh, people on Swung will know me. Like Steve said, I'm there. But I work as a geologist, Python tinkerer, and um, currently I'm working unconventional assets onshore in the US as a geologist. Um, just really happy to be here. See a lot of familiar faces on the Zoom and, and some new ones I'm looking forward to meet. Um, Anton, you wanna you wanna go ahead? Intro. Yeah, sure. So uh, my name is Anton. I um, work as a data scientist in a um, company called Energy Toolbase um, that is fully owned by Faceon. And um, yeah, just like Mike, I. Um, do play a little bit with the Python and uh, data science uh, for work and as well as for my hobbies. Cool. Thanks, Anton. So let's just go ahead and get started. So Steve's covered it pretty well intro. What we want to do is cover these two frameworks for building web apps in Python. And um, really our goal is to convince you, if you're not aware of these tools, that if you can write a Python script and you have basic, like really basic Python skills, you can build these web apps and you don't need to know any other outside um, languages, frameworks, anything like that. And, and you can really get a lot of, a lot of really good, good use for it. And, uh, and like, like Steve said, feel free to interrupt in there in the Slack, um, put questions there or just interrupt on Zoom. So Streamlit is, um, 
a framework for building web apps that's been out for a little over a year now. It's just grown a lot over, over that time. And what their claim is, this is straight from their website. You can go to their website and, and read everything that I'm going to show you here, is that it's the fastest way to build and share data apps. And in my experience, I, I think that's really true. And so what they say is you, you can turn data scripts into shareable web apps in minutes, all in Python, all in free, all for free, no front end experience required. So I'm going to convince you of that, or at least try to convince you of that today. That that if, like I said, if you have a little bit of Python experience, you have some data app or some data script, excuse me, then you can um, take that script, turn it into an app, publish it on the web in minutes for people people to use and interact with. Um, so so what is it for? What might you want to use it for? So this is. It's really primarily for if you want to have interactive apps written in Python that are hosted on a server. So, um, like Steve said, you do need to have these hosted. Um, but there's a streamlet. There's streamlet sharing, which is um, uh, their public cloud hosting service that makes it really fast and easy to share. And, and we'll we'll show that today. Um, it's really really good for quick prototypes or or minimum viable products. If you have the script, you want to share it with your customers, whether that's your teammates, clients, or or managers. Uh, you can turn that script into an app real quickly, tweak it. Um, also, it's really good for internal tools. So one of the real benefits of Streamlit is you don't have a lot of control over the layout of the and the styling of the app, which means you don't have to think about it. So if that's not a requirement for you, it will save you a lot of time having to tinker around with laying out the components of, of your app, and, and you can get things going going really fast. Um, another real interesting use for it actually is alternative to Jupyter Notebook. So a lot of people, my, myself included, really like working in that notebook environment, but you can get yourself into trouble. Um, and I've done this a number of times where you're trying to debug something and you can't figure out what it is. And the reason is you run your cells out of order. And so that there's that hidden state in the notebook that, that can trip you up sometimes. So a lot of people uh, like using Streamlit as this interactive coding environment. Um, and we'll see some of that later where it always runs from top to bottom. So you're gonna always know know where you are. So that's another another use for it. Um, all right, I'm gonna show some more about the um, overview and kind of what's the philosophy behind Streamlit. But if anybody has any questions now, you, you know, pipe, pipe up. Okay, so like I said, um, this is all from their website. So they, they have kind of a broken down into three simple principles, which I, I really like it kind of, does a good job of explaining explaining what what the library does and how it works. So the first is principle is embrace scripting. So the good thing here is you can write Streamlit apps in your favorite um, editor. You don't have to worry about a notebook if you don't like that environment. So you get to use all the fe features of your text code editor. Um, they call it their magically simple API, which which to me, even as a beginner, early intermediate, maybe um, Python coder is really intuitive. Like um, you just add these commands to your script and you don't have to worry about learning um, maybe more complicated callbacks. You don't even have to write Python classes if you, if you don't want to. Um, principle two is weave in interaction. So they have all these great widgets built in and you can actually build your own custom widgets if, if you need to. But you can see, for example, a slider widget um, to update um, a chart widget you just kind of write st altair chart and it writes a chart. There's uh, radio buttons, date pickers, all this kind of stuff. And the beauty of it really is is the widget is just a variable. So that value that you get back from the widget, so the slider is say like a value of 10, that number is in your variable. So it's, it's really straightforward. You don't have to worry about backends, routes, HTTP requests, any of that stuff. Um, it just makes writing these apps really easy and straightforward. And of course, the third, which is uh, one of their relatively newer features, is this um, public cloud hosting service that's free uh, that I mentioned earlier. It's um, as long as your app is uh, public or your code is public on GitHub, you you point this um, service to your repository, your branch, and the path to that app. Click deploy, and then within seconds, it's it's already ready to go. Um, and anyone can connect to, connect to it. It makes it just really easy to share. Okay, what else about Streamlit? So their docs are really, really good. There's some really good getting started tutorials. So that's on docs.streamlit.io. That's their website. 
on their forums are also really good, very active. People um, post questions and respond, help 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 people help each other out, share really good examples. Also, they have um, a good gallery, a good blog to kind of see you know, maybe what's what's possible, get some inspiration. Um, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go into a demo and try out this live demo, try to see if I can convince you that it's possible to go from script to app live on the cloud in a few minutes. Um, but before I get in, into that, any, any questions at this point? Cool. All right. Well, let's, let's get started on that demo then. So I was thinking of what would be a good demo to do. And I thought back to, um, the transformed 2020. So that was last year's software underground conference and Matt Hall and, and Brendan Hall did a really excellent tutorial there. Um, they called it idea to MVP. So their idea was let's build a fossil classifier app. So we will, we'll be able to push pictures and we'll do it in this tutorial. They went all the way from that idea, data analysis, train a machine learning model to predict, uh, to classify the fossil pictures and then um, build an app that was live online. And they they used Flask and um, APIs and um, really a great tutorial. So I highly recommend you to watch that. Um, but what I'm gonna do is start in the middle. So I'm gonna take their scripts and their machine learning model that they made and show a different alternative path to building this minimum viable product using Streamlit. All right, any questions on that? Any comments? complaints. All right. Nope, just can't, can't wait. <laughs> All right. Okay. Let's get started then. Okay. So here is um, their script. Um, there's a little bit of code here, but all you really need to understand, I'm going to walk you through it. So this load RF, this is their machine learning model, their random forest model that they have already trained and dumped out. So they did all the hard work really building th this model and um, I'm gonna pull it into to the app. This URL is the URL to an image that's hosted online somewhere. Um, so this just this one happens to be an image of a trilobite. Then what we do is we grab the image from that URL and make our prediction. So predict from image. And so if I run this script now, Python streamlet, yep, predict.py, what I get is the URL printed out. So let's see what that looks like. Let me open it over here. Okay, so that's that's a trilobite for sure. And it says our prediction is a class of a trilobite with 54% probability of that happening. So it seems like this um, script working really, really well. Let's, um, let's put it on online and build an app out of it. All right, so here we go. So the first thing we need to do, import Streamlit as ST. And then I'm also going to delete these print statements because we don't need them anymore because we're going to put it all into the app. And now that I have this import statement here, I can run this command streamlet run. Okay, I have it say, yeah, streamlet run predict.py. So streamlet run predict.py, that's how you start the app running. All right. So what that did is spin up a web server locally on my laptop to allow me to develop this application. So if I open this URL, it comes up to my browser. And this is just an empty web page right now. Um, and as I start making changes to the code, we'll see what happens. So this is their API ST dot, and then whatever you want to add to your app, you, you just write that code in there. So let's put a title to our page, T-I-T-L-E, and call it fossil net. So net, we're going to predict fossils. So if I save that, you'll notice here there's a little, um, uh, message here. So the app is always watching my source code. And anytime I make a sa or save or make save changes on the file, it's going to um, notice that and update. So I'm going to tell it always rerun. So that means whenever I make changes, it will automatically show up in the in the um, app over here. Okay, now the next thing we're going to do is add a widget. So like we showed before on their philosophy there, it's just as easy as adding um, a new variable. So they call their here you can see a lot of their widgets that are available and, and they're, like I said, their documentation is really, really good as well to go see what other um, widgets are available. So I'm just gonna add a text input field and give that field a label so the user will know what to do with it. Image URL, that means the user will know hopefully to paste a URL in there. 
Okay, that actually gave me an error. But look, you'll notice that the um, the URL box is here, which is really, really nice. Now the error is because no user has passed it a URL yet. So I'm gonna come in here and say, if URL, give it a little bit of control there. So if no URL has been passed, it won't do anything. And that will take that error away. Um, was there a question there? Anybody, somebody say something? No? Okay. So I'm gonna grab that URL again. So I just copied that image location from, from the internet and paste it in there. So now the app has the URL stored, stored in it. And what can we do with it? So let's display the image. That's as easy as saying st.image and pass the image. And now I press save and the image pops up in our app. Now let's, let's start um, displaying the prediction to the user with st.write and write this will, this, they call this the Swiss army knife of streamlet commands. Basically whatever you pass into write command, it will figure out what to do with it and what's the best way to display. So one of the things it can do is display a markdown, a render markdown. So I'm gonna um, put a markdown field in here and with the result. So that's the dictionary with our result and result. And we called it class is the value for our prediction. And so, uh, oh, so there we go. Save that. And now it pops up with this uh, markdown formatted trial bytes. So that's our prediction. Now let's add in a little bit more. Let's tell it the probability. So another st.write, and this time we're not going to pass it markdown. We'll just pass it um, a simple text. So probability equals, and now let's grab that result again. R e s u l t, result, and prob, and let's round it to two for a nice display, and. That should do it. Save it. Now we can see trial byte probability of 54%. Okay, cool. So now what I want to do is just show again kind of the power of that streamlet uh, dot write. And all I'm going to do is pass it the dictionary that we made before result and save it. And what we get is this nice display of a dictionary and we can minimize it. So this will let the user kind of see some, some more information. So that's that's the app. So I don't know. That took a couple of minutes. <laughs> now let me let me grab a dinosaur and let's um, see how it does with a dinosaur. Just to test it out a little bit. Paste that in there. Press enter. Dinosaur. Fifty-two percent probability. Awesome. Right. Okay. So now. Now what? We have this app running on my laptop here, and I'm gonna. How am I gonna push it out to the cloud so that everyone on the call now can use it? So that also pretty easy thanks to Streamlit. So what I need to do is push these changes to GitHub. So all I'm doing now is is the, all the changes I made, pushing them up to my GitHub repository. So I'm putting a um, commit message in here. So make app. And that should be pushed, or no, that's committed. So now let's push it. Okay, so there, that worked. Okay, so now I'm gonna come over here to Streamlit sharing. So this, you can sign up for an account to get access to Streamlit sharing. And any, any I think you can have a limited number of apps as long as they're public hosted on GitHub, I'm not sure. So I, I have a few running here, but you, you need to click new app and okay, kind of pre-populated. So here's my fork of that tutorial I mentioned, which which I've been working in. Um, I tell it the branch and then I tell it the main file path. So that's relative to the repository. Where's the um, streamlet app.py file? So in my repository, that's called streamlet predict.py. And then we're ready to go click deploy. And it should tell us here, our app is in the oven. So it's cooking the app. And what does that mean? That means that um, it's building the Docker container for us up here. And it's using the instructions I told it here in requirements.txt to know what the dependencies are. 
So for the app, these are what the dependencies in Python that we need. Um, and so you can see over here, it went through that process of installing NumPy, installing scikit-learn, and um, getting ready to deploy the app. And now, so we see the balloons. So that means that uh, I guess our app is fully baked. And now it's it's running here um, live on the cloud. So let me let me get an image here of a forum to test it out with. Images. Uh, I like this one. Um, where am I here? Did I go off of it? I'm getting kind of blocked by my Zoom. This is the one that's running locally. This is it. Yeah, this is the one. So let me paste that 4M picture in here. And there it says 4M, 88%. And um, let me see if I can paste this maybe in the Zoom chat, um, where the Slack will be easier for me. So if you're on yeah. if you're on Slack, maybe someone can um, post, it, post it in there. Um, on the Zoom chat for people who aren't in Slack. But um, yeah, check it out, try out that app. And um, to me, this is just an amazing um, technology that you can go from that script and not have to know any front end or deployment type of technology at all to, to be able to share this this type of, of stuff is, is just really, really cool. So hopefully I was able to kind of convince you of that too. And um, now, at this point, I think we're going to move on to a different framework of a panel, but we'll we'll be around for for a conversation and questions. Or actually, if you have stream of questions now, maybe we can we can address some of them before we move on to the next phase. Yeah, does it feel free to unmute and just ask the way folks? My initial question was, uh, which you answered was, uh, I think, was the yeah, the starting point was just any Python script that you're running locally, as long as you've got that requirements.txt sorted out. Exactly. And I guess conda.env as well will work from that. I think so. Um, mm -hmm. I haven't tried it. But if you're running, if you can run locally successfully, then you, yep. can, uh, yeah, you can then just deploy. Yep, because yep, I have my local environment here, environment which is built off the same requirements.txt. So I'm really comfortable that that it's going to run in the streamlet environment too, or the streamlet sharing environment. Cool. And it's basically always single user. So uh, everybody gets their own view. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, and... yeah. Anton and I talked about that. We tested it out last night because it's a little bit different than panel in that way. Um, and maybe Anton, I don't know if he's going to cover that or, or not, but, but yeah, it, every user who's, who signs into this application gets their own session, basically. It's there, everyone's isolated. So there's no shared state between, oops, between the users. Uh, nope. Okay, cool. I had a question for maybe just the whole group as well, because I know some people have maybe built, come along to have a look at stream that in, in panel because they're also thinking about uh, building their own apps already and they're looking for which framework to use. So I don't know if anybody want, wants to comment on that. If has anybody got an app in mind or maybe already started on one and wants to uh, and thinks that streaming it might work for them or maybe maybe not. I don't know. Yeah I can talk to that Steve maybe. So I I did the kind of agile geophysics course a couple of weeks ago and we'd spent a lot of time obviously looking at those synthetic wedges and uh, yes yeah, so I guess what we were hoping to do is to make something similar to this to add some of that interactivity we had on synthetic wedges and I guess like making it interactive and usable for other people has been a bit of a struggle for me previously so yeah this looks really really simple and straightforward so yeah I think we'll be giving that a go over the next couple of weeks. Cool. I guess in, in those things, you're, you're displaying images, which is fine. Yeah. Your wedges also involve like well traces and stuff. And yeah, we're kind of starting simple and just using like a, like a blocky wedge with three properties in it okay. rather than a well. So yeah, in, in the first instance, it's just using like three fixed VP, VS, AI type stuff. So yeah, it should be simple to start with. Yeah. Okay. 
So I guess that's one question. What if you wanted to plug in some, uh, how much plotting can you do in here? And what if you wanted to pl plug in a, a plot that played nicely with well data or something like that? And maybe. Yeah, absolutely. You can do that. So I, I, I don't, I don't probably not going to pull it up now because it's on Heroku. It would take a while to pull up now because it's sleeping. <laughs> But yeah. but I made um, application to um, you know you drop in it, there's a nice widget to upload file file uploader widget so you can just drag and drop a file into the application so I've have application that I've messed around with a little bit where you drop a LAS file with well log data it reads the file and then makes a plot and you can interact with the plots like um, all of your widgets will return values to you so if you want to say like you know add a slider to adjust some property of your plot you, you can easily do that and connect to your plot or um, or have drop down in the sidebar to um, change some configurations of how the plot should look. You can you can easily do things like that with Streamlit. Okay, cool. And the, the file you're dragging and dropping in is, sorry, is that a code? Or... No, that would be um, the data, the well data. Your data, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. Cool. Um, and so, of course, and, and also you can connect to the database. So, um, uh, well, I don't know how that, Will work on streamlit sharing but if you have a, a, a locally hosted on your your company private cloud for example um, you can connect to your databases and pull data from there cool um, now awesome. anton will get into this but um it, it, in kind of our experience it, it it does really really well for if you just have a few inputs and a few a few outputs once you start having a lot of a lot of options and a lot of widgets that are updating a lot of different plots or, or um, other widgets or displays, it can get kind of, um, kind of heavy. Mm -hmm. and, and that's exactly why you might want to start using panel. Okay. Yeah, Beruz was asking in, in Slack, well, if, for example, if he doesn't, does something with Altair, where there's a whole bunch of different interactivity, will they work automatically under Streamlit? Yeah, yeah. yeah. so I think Altair, uh, actually, Streamlit plays really well with Altair. If you saw on those slides that one of the widgets they showed was Altair chart. So I think if you, if uh, I'm not speaking from experience here, but just from reading the doc documentation, I think it does work really well. If you have that Altair plot set up already um, with that interaction, that's like kind of contained within the Altair plot, just pass that to the st.write or st.altair chart. And um, it, that interactivity within the Altair contained plot should should all work really well. Cool. Uh, what about, this is from Matt, what about caching operations with ST cache? Yeah, so mm -hmm. um, actually, so ST cache kind of, it does a good job of getting, so like I mentioned before, when you run or when you change, make any change to your app, it runs the whole script from top to bottom. So if you have a long running um, calculation or a long process to pull data from a database, for example, it's going to run that every time that you pull, uh, make a change to your, to any of your widgets, um, which is not really what you want. So they have this feature in there to help optimize performance called st.cache. And it, it looks at the input, you, you decorate a function with that um, st.cache decorator. And it looks at the inputs to that function and the text of the function that doesn't rerun it unless one of those two things has changed. And um, so, so that's a really good way to get around some of that latency of having to rerun the whole thing over again. Um, now, Anton, maybe you want to comment on that and see like that only gives you so far. Um, it does work really well, but there are still some limitations to that. Yeah, I mean, since we're talking about this already, uh, I was hoping to <laughs> describe that difference later, but given, um, given the circumstance. so. <laughs> The, the way ST cache works is that it actually calculates a hash function of the inputs and the, uh, the function code, right? So if you didn't change the function code, but change the inputs, um, the, the caching mechanism uh, essentially needs to calculate um, sort of a mapping from the input into an integer and then look for that integer in the cache. So it's like cache is like a warehouse and that integer is like a key to a door in a warehouse. So um, if you're passing, if you're trying to cache a function that let's say eats a big data frame and then makes a plot out of it, you can imagine that hashing of the a data frame will actually be a pretty expensive operation. So even though your plot will be cached, 
just to find the key in a huge keychain uh, will be a long operation. And that's where um, kind of this caching mechanism will start sort of introducing uh, latency. So, um, which is why Streamlit worked on this feature where you can actually pass your own caching um, function override. So instead of uh, trying to calculate the hash function of the whole data frame, um, you can calculate a hash function of the first, let's say, 10 lines of the data frame, which will be much faster. Um, and that, that's kind of one of the ways to, um, to circumvent the, the problem of, uh, like the big data frames hash. Mm. Cool. And there's one more question. Well, uh, Martin was asking, does this give you an API for free as well? Or would it work only based on being given input? I think that's the question, Martin. Yeah, okay. I saw that on here. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I'm just, I'm just wondering. Um, I, I've had a look since. It looks like you can use Fast API in the background, so you know you can use Streamlit to deploy a Fast API script. Yeah, yeah. I think that would be the way to go. Is if you want to have an API set up up ahead of time, and then just have your Streamlit app make calls to that API. Yeah. Awesome. Well, let's let Anton continue now. Is your putting over to Anton's? Yeah, uh, let me pull um, up the slides for Anton. We're going to have a look at, yeah, the other side of things of the panel. OK, so um, I'll talk about the, the other dashboarding framework called Panel. Um, the, whatever I talk about um, in what follows is strictly my own opinion. Um, and I am somewhat opinionated sometimes. So take that with a grain of salt and um, do not trust <laughs> the face value of it necessarily. But so essentially panel is a bit, um, is a bit of like streamlit on steroids to some extent. Um, it's also worth mentioning at this point that the two projects were developed, I would say somewhat in parallel uh, chronologically and there are, in fact, there are developers in the open source community that contributed to both, um, basically taking the best part of Streamlit, bringing it into panel, take the best panel, sorry, take the best parts of panel, bringing it to the Streamlit. Uh, so there was a lot of um, cross pollination. Uh, but I'll start with the preamble. So let's go to the next slide. Hey, Michael, can you go to the next slide? Oh, yeah, there you go. So I guess. Why do we need to have two um, fr frameworks that achieve somewhat similar goals? I would say back in maybe 2015, 16, um, when I was an intern um, at Nixon, I had this sort of problem where um, sharing things interac uh, interactively with uh, folks around was somewhat difficult, uh, especially if you were in Python, um, because if you were to switch to R, uh, you would have this package called Shiny, uh, which in retrospect is very similar to Panel or to Streamlit. And developing things in Shiny was such a pleasure and deploying them was super easy. You did not need to know anything about JavaScript or TypeScript at all. And Python kind of missed that for a long time until uh, folks from Streamlit, um, Bokeh and Panel um, showed up with great pieces of functionality. So that's kind of preamble why these libraries were, I think, um, intensely developed in the recent years to begin with. So a word about Streamlit. So as Mike mentioned, Streamlit runs your code uh, top to bottom every time you change uh, anything on the interface side or um, you make some other uh, some other change uh, on the application, which could be um, could be a problem, but is also a great solution for um, sorry a, a great solution against a uh, human factor when you let's say develop in Jupiter and your um, the order of your uh, chunks execution is all over the place. Streamlit would not let you do that. Streamlit would always run your code uh, top to bottom. However, 
if you're changing one little thing about the application, why would you still run um, the rest of the code? Why not just run the code that um, is connected or linked to that interface piece um, only and that only? So that's kind of what panel solves quite nicely. Um, just like Streamlit, uh, both uh, panel does not really require you to know anything about TypeScript or JavaScript. Um, although they heavily, the, the widgets and the elements of the app heavily rely on those two. It is also really um, kind of quick to prototype first and uh, then deploy later. It has a really wide um, kind of set of uh, widgets that you could use that are demonstrated through their documentation, as I will um, show later, as well as it's very community driven and community supported. Um, as a, I guess, as opposed to Streamlit, Panel is um, supported by NumFocus, I think, since recently. And um, it is, I guess, truly an open source project, whereas Streamlit, while being an open source project, um, is now part of the um, actually for profit company, if I'm not mistaken, um, also called Streamlit. So uh, you can see that one of the products might actually develop <laughs> a bit faster than the other. Um, in the time to come. But nevertheless, let's talk about panel a bit more. So oh, can we change the slide? Yeah, perfect. So this is an example of the very basic panel app. So there are multiple ways to develop panel apps. And the one that I prefer is um, especially through classes. So for each of your apps or dashboards, you'd have to develop sort of an overarching class that would control the behavior of the dashboard um, with the methods that would either be uh, the exhibits of the dashboard or uh, methods that would interact with the exhibit or, or change it in one way or another. The way you set up widgets in this, uh, in this API style is through essentially assigning class attributes. So as you see here, um, there are, a few class attributes uh, such as offset, amplitude, phase, frequency, um, and extra, extra range and Y range. So basically what those do is they're defined through this other library called Param. Um, and so what the purpose of the Param library is kind of mainly typing and um, type checking validation um, for, I guess, the variables that they're assigned to, but also um, panel relies on this library to essentially automatically figure out the best widget for um, for the parameter at hand. So, for example, if um, if we specify offset as a um, numeric value with uh, some sort of default value and bound it in a uh, in a range, you could guess that it should be a slider, right? So panel interprets it as a slider. Same thing happens for the amplitude, phase, and frequency. Um, and then parameter n, which is how many points we're going to draw um, for the sine wave, it is basically an integer, right? And it's non bound. Because it's unbounded, panel decides, OK, this is probably a, an integer, um, should be interpreted as a text input, sorry, as a uh, numeric input. So that's why the field for n is uh, just a regular input. And you can see for S range and Y, and y range, you, you pass the kind of tuple as a default. And so panel figures out, OK, if this is uh, supposed to be a range, therefore a range should have you know, the, the lower end, the higher end, and therefore should be interpreted as a slider with, um, with two, uh, I guess, two points. Um, yeah, with two points, with, with the uh, upper and uh, lower bounds. So next, you kind of define um, the method. So you define your init, um, and you create essentially a data set in the typical bokeh style. Um, and you actually create a plot. And what happens next is this um, update plot function, right? So panel relies on these things called decorators, um, specifically the param depends. 
So if you decorate a function with param depends, um, what is going to happen is that function will be executed if and only if, I think, the um, any of those parameters is changed. And it's going to watch for their changes. Um, so basically, if you change frequency, amplitude offset, or any of those other um, parameters, update pod will be executed. And as you see, uh, the data will be replaced by the new data calculated in um, self sign call. And then uh, the plot will be eventually updated. So on the next slide, you can see that in action. So let's go to the next slide. So you see I'm updating title here. Uh, it's changed to the software on the ground. Now I'm changing offset. It moves back and forth. Same for the amplitude, phase, and frequency. So those of you who are familiar with Bokeh realize that this is kind of very close to uh, the typical way of developing uh, Bokeh apps, except that um, a lot of things were guessed for you automatically. And also your app does not look like um, just a whole lot of text on the screen. It's rather developed as a nice um, kind of structured, uh, structured class object. Um, let's go to the next slide. So panel plays nicely with um, lots of things. Um, so you can you can create markdown and um, HTML widgets, just kind of similar to what Mike showed for the streamlet. You can add any of the bokeh objects, uh, Altair objects, eCharts. Uh, if you're a fan of whole views, you can set up whole views, um, plotly. You can also change the view of the apps um, completely through using templates. There's a couple of templates templates already available for you. So again, you don't need to know about JavaScript or TypeScript to make your application pretty. It also you can also include um, VTK displays. Uh, you can type in your favorite formulas in LaTeX um, or bring in um, mapping um, functionality with Folium, for example. Let's go to the next slide. Um, so kind of similar to Streamlit, Panel relies on these things called widgets uh, that could be added to the app. And what's really great about Panel documentation is that um, they have a gallery of the example apps, but they also have reference gallery where for each widget, you get an example of how it is used in a um, kind of like Jupyter style um, environment, which means you can just copy a notebook if you really want to, or you can uh, browse it through the, uh, like through your browser um, and figure out how to um, include this widget into your application. So on this slide, you can see different uh, examples of what you could add. And then um, next slide, please. That's not the end of it. So yeah, we have uh, a lot more other wid widgets to include. Um, so I just showed here and then next slide. Yeah, that's not the end. So they've been adding widgets like crazy these days. And a couple of ones uh, that are really new and really exciting to me are the speech to text and text to speech. Um, so you could play with those as well uh, and a bunch of other things. So you could actually de uh, develop things as complicated as you know getting um, video stream from your webcam and trying to do some um, real time computer vision uh, from the video stream. Um, or you could stream video and talk and then do some more complicated um, fun applications that interact with both the audio and video. So let's get to the next slide. All right, um, I showed you a very simple example and walk through the code a little bit. Now let's go to a bit more complicated example where I think the panel really shines. So where that reactivity part is um, kind of like where we could rely on that reactivity part and use it to our advantage. So in the beginning of a pandemic, um, we had this interesting problem. So Myself um, and one of my colleagues, uh, Braden here, um, we sort of participated in this 
a little program, so to speak, where um, we would deliver beers to um, our engineering colleagues um, on Fridays, end of the day. And then as the pandemic uh, sort of hit, we realized that uh, the deliveries are now complicated because we live all over Calgary and it takes time to deliver beers, right? Uh, when everyone lives uh, all over the city. So we decided that we need a way to kind of optimize, optimize our routing so that we could punch in our addresses and uh, get a Google Maps link um, so that we could open it on our mobile phones and then just follow uh, whatever is the optimal route. And also um, part of the, uh, another contributor to this project is Mike Virgino, uh, who's also, who's my former manager, but also is co-owner of this um, <laughs> um, craft brewery in Calgary. And so for him, this problem definitely had a bit of a uh, business value as well. So I'll just show maybe an example of what the app does. If I could share screens. All right, can you guys see my screen? Yep. All right, so the idea here is that you select your number of destinations, you select uh, however waypoints you want uh, per batch, however many. Um, I can talk about that later, but it's just a small technical detail. And so what you could do next is you could either type in each address manually, or you can copy this, um, these four lines, paste them in here. Then there's a little button here that imports the destinations and populates the widgets on the left. Um, and then if you select your departure point, for example, uh, one of my neighbor's house it should in theory uh, create a waypoint for you uh, sorry create a path for you and show it on display so this is just a simple bokeh uh, bokeh map so it tells me that here's where i start and here's where i end and then that's how i need to traverse it and now the best part is that if i click this link with either my phone uh, from my phone or from here, it will get me to um, Google Maps, hopefully, with all these um, points arranged in the right order. And then I can just, on my phone, I would click um, go and it would start navigating around. So this is kind of, in a nutshell, what the app does. And yes, it runs, uh, it is powered with a panel. And looks like, yeah, there you go. So deployment of panel applications is a bit more complicated than Streamlit, simply because again, um, they don't have necessarily the money to spend on the infrastructure. Um, so what they offer you to do is to go with the um, platforms like Heroku and the deployment there would be as easy as essentially changing your code, uh, creating a Docker file for it, making sure the um, Docker file runs nicely locally. And then you, um, you push that, push that um, Docker file, sorry, you push that um, Docker container into um, Heroku container repository, and then you release it and it's nice and uh, deployed um, into your Heroku app. So I think I probably did a bad job of not pausing for questions, but I'm happy to take the whole barrage now. Cool, thanks, Anton. Yeah, folks, just unmute if you've got a question. I had one. So I, I've also seen a panel that there's, because you you wrote a Python class there to encapsulate the whole dashboard, no? And I've, but I've seen panel used with uh, bokeh and stuff in a more of a functional style, or you're just making calls to panel without defining a class? Um, yeah. Yes, you could do that. Um, I guess I'm just <laughs> a fan of things um, structured a little bit better, simply because I kind of want um, 
you know, I want to safely go for a party on Friday. Um, and on Monday, I want to come back, look at my code and realize exactly how it works. Um, so that's kind of why I would prefer a bit of a structured approach. But you can easily um, just write code kind of similar way to Streamlit, and it would work just fine as long as you connect your um, connect your widgets together manually. The if you write your application uh, for panel through class, the linking is actually done for you through this uh, decorators, uh, much nicer. So I see Matt wanted to see the Docker file, so um, I just mm -hmm. brought it up. Matt, do you wanna? Are you looking for anything in particular? Do you wanna? Okay, um, <laughs> right. So I actually expose five zero zero six. It doesn't really matter what you expose, I guess, because um, for um, when you're when you're deploying that to um, Heroku, it exposes its own port that you have to pass through um, the environmental variable um, right here. So this doesn't really matter, I guess. Um, the other thing that you might notice is this weird installation of Firefox um, and XVFB. And you would question why the hell, Anton, do you need Firefox in your Docker container that runs uh, beer delivery dashboard? I'll tell you why. So we have about 20 engineers in the engineering team. And we are not willing to pay for Google Maps API. Um, the, the link generator for Google Maps allows you to have only, I think, up to nine waypoints. If you exceed nine waypoints, um, you need to pay for the Google Maps to still be able to create links. So what we actually did is, um, you see there's an index zero over here. If there were more than nine waypoints, we would just um, break them into, um, multiple groups and then cap, uh, basically try to chain links uh, manually. And the, the best way to do that is through um, essentially interaction with the browser in a headless fashion through Selenium. So it's a bit of a hack for sure, which also um, embarrassingly brought the size of my Docker image to, um, to this, which is certainly not something I'm proud of. So that little dashboard in the Docker container is about this heavy. Um, so yeah, definitely so just not be, it, But Just to be clear there, you're, you're, you're launching a headless Firefox in a Docker container. Correct. And using Selenium, Selenium which is Java, to go and emulate clicks um, on the non-existent yeah. web page, rendering the Google Maps. Correct, correct. Okay. <laughs> yep, that's cool. It's definitely, yeah, definitely up there with uh, the hacks. But great. Still Can fits on the Huroku as a comment. Sorry. Have the described by and then the reference. I don't think I heard the question. Um, can you please repeat it? You, you might have been hearing my, my wife slash office mate in the background. Oh, OK. <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess a couple of final um, remarks here. Um, for those of you um, working in a company with very strict uh, IT policies, which um, many of us are, um, let's say you have your own VPN and you need to deploy the app. Well, both Streamlit and Panel will allow you to essentially um, act as a server. So as long as your company allows you to, um, to act as a server within the network, you can send the link um, of your IP to your colleague and then they can hit, your, uh, hit that IP and the server is already there serving your app. Um, that's kind of nice. Yeah, that, so, that's something when I, how I first started using it at work is just like spinning up something on my computer that's connected to the network and just sending that IP to my 
neighbor across the hall on the on the team, and and then they can just use that app um, hosted on my on my on my uh, desktop. Yeah, and the, again, like you might have you might have thought after looking at this panel that it's a bit uglier than Streamlit, and I would say maybe out of the box it is, except that applying templates is a one line of code. You don't need to do anything, and it will look like a nice, um, like a nice application um, straight out the, out of the box. Um, I would agree, though, that the learning curve is perhaps a tiny bit steeper, but it is an investment in the the truly reactiveness um, of the application, where you don't need to worry about um, caching that much and and basically. Um, avoiding the overhead of some of the functions while uh, like developing your code. So you like, you don't need to isolate your functions uh, manually. Whereas in Streamlit, I've done numerous hacks to um, kind of get to the isolation part so that I don't need to, so that I don't need to, uh, sorry, so that I don't run um, the, the redundant, redundant code only to achieve one little uh, plot change. And I think another I have a comment. Question. Um, oh, go ahead, Matteo. Oh, I am. Um, so I, I, you know, I started on panel last year for transform just to create that uh, color map uh, demonstration, bad color map demonstration. And then I did uh, a bit this year at, at work with, you know, like uh, making a, a log visualization uh, to do filtering and you know dealing with nulls and, and stuff. So uh, it's really been working well for me. Uh, I have to say I've stuck with um, Binder for deployment and didn't really invest any time in looking at Heroku because you know I had a better experience with Voila. Uh, prior and I, I need to go back to it uh, but Anton I was wondering if you wanted to comment on at least for, for my sake you know have you have you deployed anything to binder using binder and is there like what are the main differences just just you know for the in completely layman's perspective um never touched binder so I actually can't tell you anything about it okay. um the reason so what, one of the one of the nice things, and I don't know about Binder either in particular, but one of the nice things about um, Panel, if you do like working in a notebook environment, you can d fully develop your application in the notebook, which, you, yeah, you probably know this if you work that's in what I'm, Yeah, that's what I do. Yeah, so I, I imagine that's possibly in Panel, you can just have that like dot servable on your Panel app. And I, I don't know, I'd be interested to, to see how that would work. That, that's how I did it. Um, yeah. And then you know it just goes to binder. Cool. Yeah. As long as you you only need your uh, your environment uh, file for that to work, which is pretty good to me. And then you can send just a link. So I would say um, another thing is this application uses API keys. So API keys is not something you should put in a notebook. Uh, God forbid, because you're exposing your API's key to uh, everyone, right? Okay. So the thing with Heroku is you can easily set up those API's keys through the config bars. And so if you need to deploy an application that relies on um, the external data, like that looks like a very kind of no brainer for me. And just Heroku is just so simple to essentially follow with the tutorials. They take care of um, like a lot, kind of a lot of things in the background. You don't have to create a Docker file, really. You could even go much simpler and just follow their Python app tutorials, um, and they'll create the Docker in the background for you. But because at work, I heavily rely on um, AWS services like ECS, ECR, um, I'm kind of reasonably familiar with the, um, with the best practices and workflows when it comes to deployment um, like locally versus remotely. So I, I know the pains of uh, not going through Docker and then realizing that something goes wrong and then it's just harder to debug. Whereas 
in Docker, if you if it works locally, there's a much higher chance that it will work um, remotely as well, um, because it's sort of like what's on the box is inside of the box uh, approach. So yeah, can't talk about binder much, but there's definitely a way to um, to go with Heroku um, for kind of simple and difficult apps alike. But, you know, perhaps the first step for somebody that wants to dab into it and, you know, ignoring the API keys is to, you know, say, like me, I have an app that, you know, I created in the notebook. You, you could essentially transfer that to a script and then, you know, test the Heroku deployment with that script. Or, or can you also use a notebook to deploy onto Heroku? Yes, you can. So okay, you then it's, it's an easy, easy transition. Yeah, if you follow their Python um, application tutorial, um, it is actually pretty easy. Okay, great. The thing is, or again, um, this is kind of comes from, um, I guess, o over time use of Docker containers. You kind of want your container to be as small as possible. As soon as you bring Jupyter as a requirement into um, your either Streamlit or a panel app, um, actually doesn't matter, any app. Um, Jupyter should not be like, should not be a requirement for running an application, right? Because it, it kind of bloats the container with a lot of things that will be used only for serving. So going, um, um, sorry, going forward, that's not a great practice because that will take more, uh, more time to deploy. That will take more traffic to deploy, which is what you pay for. Um, that also will take more space on your, um, the Docker repositories, either ECR or whatever you're paying for it, like Azure or whatever. Um, so point is, you kind of want to make those as small as possible. And in my case, at work, I deal with a lot of edge devices and most of them are on the LTE networks. And we are definitely not sending a 1.6 uh, gigabytes Docker image to an edge on an LTE network. Cool. Yeah, just to comment on the my binder thing, because the thing is, that's the thing, if you're working in a uh, notebook anyway, then the my binder is just a convenient way to get that notebook up and it will build a Docker container for you. But then it will always start a Jupyter uh, server and Jupyter notebook session and then look for which file that you don't actually load for you. So it's just a way to get to a Jupyter hub style thing quickly. Uh, and then as soon as you want to step out of that, uh, and I understand what Matteo is saying, that if you've got a voila solution, then maybe you can easily, then, you know, just switch voila on. But as soon as you want to get more complicated, or anyway, as soon as you want to do more than you can just do in the notebook and have something a bit more streamlined, then it does, definitely does make sense to deploy. Uh, properly, as it were, or, or differently. There was a question in the YouTube chat from Eric. So this is going back to your Booze Cruise example. Would it be easy to swap out Bokeh, for example, for iPy Leaflet? Um, yeah, actually, there's probably examples for that um, in the in the panel. So I wouldn't be surprised if it's. Um, Pretty simple, but then again, um, the the rest of the functionality needs to be uh, also kind of taken care of. Uh, so like placing the map, placing the markers, placing the um, the strings with the addresses. As long as you can do that in um, whatever uh, framework you want, then you'd be able to switch. Cool. Was there any other questions? I think Anton needs to take a break for a minute. Anyway, but uh, we've got time if there's any more, any more questions or any more points that people want to one comment I was going to say earlier before Mateo's question is uh, regarding the layouts in panel. I think in their, not their most recent release, but the one before they have um, 
they've added a lot of those templates like Anton mentioned. So if you want to pull from like a um, sample template that maybe has a sidebar, a header bar, and a, um, a main spot to put put your widgets in the sidebar and your plots in the main spot, you can do that really easily. Um, and I think you also have the ability to do your own Jenja templates. So you can lay out your your app just totally custom how, how you want to if you if you need that that requirement. Yeah. And I think just to try and summarize between the two of it as well is that, I mean, panel, the panel you are needing to think in a much more event-driven way. So those decorators that Anton was hooking up, they're specifying fire this event, fire this function when this event fires, and you're chaining things together like that. And the stream that you don't, and the stream that you just, you just have the script that's rerun every time and you change the state and the whole, the whole thing changes. Yeah, cool. There was a question further up in the thread, I think it came in from YouTube again, which was about Google Earth Engine. And would it, would it be, is it possible to use Google Earth Engine with uh, Streamlit? And basically there was an answer saying, well, anything with a Python binding, you can put, you can put in, but I don't know if there's any other considerations there. Has anybody used Google Earth Engine? Um, there's a couple limitations. The biggest one is that it's got to be non-commercial use. Um, so research or academic use only. So research or teaching is the main one, um, unless that's changed in the last few months. Uh, I'm not sure in terms of other limitations in terms of usage and things like that, but it's a best effort service. So um, okay. Google, Earth in gen Google Earth Engine in general is a best effort service. Um, cool. uh, it's you, also, it's JavaScript first. There are Python bindings available, but I'm not sure how well they work or how different they are or if they're just, you know, basically you're writing JavaScript with Python um, or if they are actually you know, Pythonistic at all. Hmm. Um, Pythonic, sorry, if they're Pythonic at all. Um, cool. It's I mean, just a if, fetch service, is it? So you're just, you're just, are you, are you actually also posting jobs to Google Earth Engine? Uh, yes, you are. So, so, so Google Earth Engine, the idea behind it is that you can take, they've got a stupid amount of data, like all the, the entire Landsat archive, um, the entire, I think they've got all the Sentinel stuff as well from the ESA. Um, they've got pop, some population data. They've got a whole, <clears throat> their data catalog is very impressive if you start going through and looking at it. And you can then start running queries and things like that. So you can, for example, pull out Landsat imagery between particular months for the last 10 years and display that with a slider type of thing. That's what you can do. Um, and you can do that for the entire planet, or you can get a smaller area and just do the stats for there and things like that. So there are definitely, you, you're definitely hitting their servers to do some of that computing. It's mm. you know, cloud-based sort of massive remote sensing as a service type of thing. Um, cool. Right. Well, if there are no other questions, or if there's anything Anton, Michael want to conclude with, we can just wrap it up there. Yeah, I think thanks very much for the presentations. They were really good. Really good to see the two frameworks side by side. And uh, thanks for putting it together. Yeah, thanks yeah, a lot, I mean, Steve. The closing thought probably, for me at least, would be that both of these app, both of these approaches um, have their own pros and cons, and by no means I am a diehard panel fan versus Streamlit. I, I use both, and I and it's good to kind of know the advantages of disadvantages uh, when you make a choice. But at the same time, um, both systems have have a very strong community support 
and I encourage you to check the documents um, kind of like um, in breadth rather than depth to kind of see the examples of the apps and the reference galleries for, for both of them. Because um, like one of the best ways to learn is to learn by examples. And I would say that the community works really hard to make sure those examples are relatable and kind of easy to port and build the analogies of. Great. Okay, so we'll leave it there, folks. Thanks again, Anton, Michael, and uh, thanks everybody. And we'll see you at the see you at the next one. See you on Swan. Okay. Have a great day. Bye bye. You too.